How do you do? Jen and Cam feel it would be unkind to present this program without a friendly word of warning. We are about to unfold our true crime podcast, a podcast of lifelong friends who seek to examine crimes which were committed without reckoning upon God. The discussion will be frank, and the subject matter will be of a grim and violent nature. I think it will thrill you. It might even horrify you. So, if there are young children listening, or if you feel unwilling to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Well, we've warned you. Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Cold. It's cold. It is brutally cold. And I always think about those poor little animals outside. All of them. I was thinking about birds today. What do they do? It's terrible. That's all. (laughs) I'm just sitting down here in my basement. My nose is cold. My chin is cold. Even with the heater on, it's cold. Not me. Remember how I record in my closet and I'm usually hot and Mm -hmm. taking off layers of clothing as we go? So for once, I'm toasty. I'm good. Happy as a little baby swaddled up in the crib. Well, Mm. good for you. I'm really fucking happy for you. Thanks. (laughs) Because really, it's all about me. It always Uh, has been. It always has been. Always will be. Always will be, girl. Always will be. So you got a case for us or what? I do. You ready for it? I do. Is it a good one? It's sad. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But you ready? I am so ready. Yes. All right. Today's case is taking us to Woodstock, Ontario in Canada, our northern neighbors here in the North America. Woodstock is about 95 miles southwest of Toronto. Its population is close to 40,000 people. They like to call themselves the friendly city. And the majority of the population work in manufacturing or construction jobs. Also, agriculture plays a big part in this blue-collar town, and that's why it's dubbed the Dairy Capital of Canada. Now, there's a darker side to Woodstock. Like most of the blue-collar towns in North America, they've been hit hard by the opioid crisis. And this is because many blue-collar jobs require intense manual labor. This can lead to work-related injuries. Now, these workers get hurt, and they go seek help for their pain. Due to pharmaceutical companies incentivizing oxycodone, which is the active ingredient in Oxycontin and Percocet, the doctors, at one point in the 90s, started handing out pills like they were candy. Mm. And as you know, because of that, we now have what's known as the opioid crisis. And this case that I'm going to talk about right here This was the first to kind of shed light on how bad this crisis affected this small town of Woodstock. Mm -hmm. The Toronto Star actually did an article on it and quoted a man saying, give me $20 and two minutes and I'll get you Oxycontin. Yes, it's that easy. Mm. Horrible. It's horrible. And it is so highly addictive, man. It really is. April 8th, 2009 started out like any normal school day. Tara McDonald said that her eight-year-old daughter, Victoria Stafford, had been in a great mood that morning. She borrowed her mom's headband and butterfly earrings, dabbed on a bit of lip gloss, and went to school. Victoria was excited because she was going to see her father that night, and she hadn't seen him in six months. Her mother and father were separated. And she was going to watch High School Musical 3 with her friends after school. Well, normally, Victoria's older brother, Darren, was supposed to walk her home. And since they had just moved into a new house, it would be the first time they'd be going home to this new house. And when he couldn't find Victoria, he went home and realized she wasn't there either. So he cycled around the neighborhood looking for her. Now, Tori was a sweet, friendly girl that at her old house, sometimes she would stop and play with friends before heading home. So they didn't quite worry about her until about 5 p.m. When she wasn't home, her mother Tara calls her own mother, Linda to say that Tori was missing. 
Linda drives to Tara's house, and they two drive around town looking for Tori. At 6 p.m. that evening, when she still wasn't home, Tori's grandmother, Linda, notified the police, and the search began. No one could find Tori. Hmm. On April 9th, CCTV from outside the school was uncovered. This video showed Tori walking with a black-haired woman who was wearing a white coat. Oxford Community Police appealed for the woman in the footage to come forward, but no one did. Tori's grandparents offered a $10,000 reward for her return. Once the video came out, Tara phoned the police and told them that the person in the video looked like 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClendick. Now, she knew Terry Lynn because she had bought pills at her mother's house, and Terry Lynn had been there. She had bought Oxycontin pills at her mother's house, and Terry Lynn had been there. When the police looked into Terry Lynn, they saw she had a warrant out for her arrest for a parole violation. So they went and arrested her on April 12th. And as Terry Lynn sat in the interrogation room, she laughed when she was asked if that was her on the video. She said that there was no way in hell that was her. But she did say she was in the area that day, and she was wearing a white jacket, but she was buying drugs, not abducting a child. Terry Lynn was then sent to a youth detention center in London, Ontario. The Oxford Community Police came under public criticism after they failed to issue an Amber Alert once Tory was reported missing. But after they were notified that Tory was missing, the Community Police did call the Ontario Provincial Police to order the Amber Alert. But they said no because it didn't meet the requirements needed to issue the Amber Alert, which were, this is the criteria that it was, one, a child under 18 had been abducted, two, a child was in danger of serious harm, three, there was enough descriptive information about the child or abductor so that the media alert would be helpful. Because of this huge backlash that the police faced, the Ontario Provincial Police Commissioner, Julia Fantino, announced that they had changed the way that Amber Alerts were handled. Now the police only need to have suspicion that a child is in danger before issuing an alert. Yeah. It makes you wonder, Victoria's case, none of that criteria, I guess, was met. But, you know, you never know. If it had been met, maybe she would have been found sooner. Now, at first, like everything, Tori's parents were suspected in the disappearance of their daughter, and they underwent polygraph examinations to try and lift suspicion from themselves. And the public started blaming Tara, saying that she was high on oxy when Tori went missing. And it seemed that Tara had suffered from this opioid crisis. She had been battling an Oxycontin addiction, and she had been going to a methadone clinic for two years prior to Tori's disappearance. Now, to tell you how bad this town was, it was a small town, 40,000, with a methadone clinic. The report that I read said anywhere between 250 to 350 a day were going to the methadone clinic. That's wow. pretty bad. And I tried to look to see if it got better. I don't know. All I know is the town is more prosperous because the Toyota moved in and so more people are getting jobs and it's getting better. So you go Woodstock. The Ontario Provincial Police took over the case and it was officially listed as an abduction. Victoria's father, Rodney Stafford, posted on Facebook pleading with whoever had his daughter just to drop her off somewhere and promised him that, quote, daddy and the world are coming for Victoria. Now, of course, I'm using Victoria and Tori interchangeably. They, mm -hmm. they called her Tori. Now, this investigation had been enormous. Over 900 police officers were involved in the case, and there were thousands of pieces of evidence being analyzed. The townspeople were searching high and low, fields, ponds, everything. People were handing out posters. I mean, everybody was trying to find Tori. And of course, rumors were going left and right. Not only, you know, here Tara, they said, was high on oxy on the couch when Tori went missing. They were also saying that Tori was taken in some sort of revenge plot for a $20,000 drug debt that Tara owned. But they pretty much crossed that out because there was never any ransom call. And, of course, Tara's didn't owe anybody any money. Police went door to door looking for things. Ground searches, like I said, canine units. Hours of CCTV footage was combed. Nothing. 
besides the one in the school, nothing. No sign of Victoria at all. Mm. This case became so well known that it was even featured on America's Most Wanted on April 25th in 2009. By the beginning of May, investigators still had no idea where Tori was, but released footage of a dark colored station wagon that was seen at the same street where Tori was last seen. A composite sketch of a woman seen on the CCTV video with Tori was just released to the public. And it was of a white female with a black ponytail, believed to be aged between 19 and 25 years old. A substantial award of $50,000 was offered for information that could lead to the arrest and the conviction of those responsible for Tori's abduction. The pressure of public scrutiny was taking its toll on Victoria's parents, and during a press conference, the two had the most horrible argument on live TV. It was really? horrible. And I can only, I mean, they're separated anyway. They've got the stress of their daughter missing. They're blaming yeah. each other. I mean, it's just awful. Tori's father, Rodney, accused Tara of appearing emotionless. And then Tara hit back that he was just crying for the cameras and like, you haven't seen her in six months, blah, blah. I mean, it was, it's online. You can watch it. It's heartbreaking. It's stress, too. It's horrible. Yeah. Sad that that had to happen, though, in front of, you know what I mean? Right. They stopped the press conference and then they came back the next day and they're like, you know, we need to stand our ground. We need to keep a strong front. We need, we can't fight, you know. Right. They came back, but it was, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch. Mm -hmm. And, Tara urged the public, you know, please just focus on finding Tori. The drug debt was rumored. Forget about me and my drug addiction. Just focus on Tori. She pleaded. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's heartbreaking. All of this is on the news did a fantastic job. You can find all these videos on YouTube. It's amazing what they covered. On May 19th, 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClinic was brought in once again for questioning. She was interviewed by Ontario Detective Staff Sergeant Jim Smith. Now, Jim Smith is the same Ontario Provincial Police Officer who former Canadian military commander Russell Williams confessed to raping and killing two women. Do you remember this? He's the big mm -hmm. officer that would, he also broke into oh. like 82 homes to steal underwear from women and children oh and remember I he do. took and the pictures of himself in like swimsuits yes. and lingerie yeah yes this oh. is the officer oh. is the same one who did that he's a kick-ass police sergeant man oh, i don't I think do i'd want to be that. interviewed with him i'd be confessing to stuff i didn't want to do <laughs> <laughs> at first sergeant smith wasn't getting anywhere from her she was just denying everything but after some time she was in there for six hours and 15 minutes. But then she confessed that she and her boyfriend, Michael Rafferty, were responsible for murdering eight-year-old Tori. And like I said, the interview was over six hours and 15 minutes long. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. And at one point, Terry Lynn is bawling and she's wiping her eyes and she's crying and all this kind of stuff. And the detective leaves and she's like, she's fine. She's fine. And what? then, she, yeah, she quits crying. And then... He comes back and, oh, my gosh, she's just bawling again. It's like a big... Do, mm. do they not realize that that's the whole reason it's, officers do that is to spy on them to see how they react I, when they leave? Yeah. I don't know. I oh mean, boy. she could have quit crying because he wasn't there in front of her and mm -hmm. she just was thinking other happy thoughts after... Uh, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's It's suspicious. But anyway, here's what Terry Lynn tells Officer Jim Smith. According to Terry Lynn, she had met Michael two months before the abduction of Tori. They were both addicted to drugs, and Michael had expressed his desire to kidnap a child. And he told Terry Lynn he wanted her to abduct a young female because he said, quote, the younger they were, the easier they are to manipulate. So on April 8th, 2009, she wanted to prove that she wasn't all talk. And she led Tori from outside of her elementary school to Michael's Honda Civic, which was parked in the retirement home parking lot just down the street. Now, normally Tori would walk out with like all of her school friends, but that day she forgot her earrings. So she had to go back and get them. And so when she was coming out, she was all by herself. Terry Lynn saw that Tori was alone and went over to her and introduced herself as T. 
She then asked if she said, hey, you want to see my Shih Tzu puppy? And Tori said, yes, of course, because she had a Shih Tzu at home. They crossed the street hand in hand, and then Terry Lynn pushed her into the car and made her lay down in the back seat, and they covered her with a coat. As they drove out of Woodstock, Terry Lynn spoke with Tori about her favorite TV shows and what she enjoyed, and Tori told her she loved Hannah Montana, and she was actually wearing a Hannah Montana shirt at the time. And during the drive, Michael kept listening for an Amber Alert or a news bulletin on the radio about the abduction, but there was nothing. He even took the battery out of his phone so he couldn't be tracked. He knew he was, you know, mm-hmm. it was serious. In Guelph, Ontario, he stopped at a Tim Hortons and got coffee, and he left Terry Lynn and Tori in the car alone. Then he went to buy Percocet from a house around the same area. While they were alone, Tori asked Terry Lynn if she could go home, and Terry Lynn promised her that she could, and she also promised that she wouldn't let anything happen to her. That's heartbreaking. Then they made a third stop in Gelp, a Home Depot store. Michael instructed Terry Lynn to go in and buy a claw hammer and some garbage bags. Tori asked Terry Lynn not to leave her alone, and she was promised that she wouldn't be. She said, you know, I I promise I'm not going to be long. I'll be right back. Don't worry, right? CCTV footage showed Terry Lynn calmly buying the claw hammer and garbage bags in the Home Depot. After the last stop, or after this stop, I should say, they drove to a rural area and parked down a laneway in a field about 500 meters from concession number six. Terry Lynn said Michael raped Tori in the back of the car while she walked away so she wouldn't have to see it. I just, I don't even know how to have the mental fortitude to know that you need to step away from the car so you don't have to and hear not that. save her i know and not let it happen to her so we'll get into her later afterward terry lynn held tori's hand and they got out of the car so tori could urinate terry lynn noticed blood in the snow after tori peed mm. Tori asked her not to let Michael do it again, and Terry Lynn told her that she was a very strong girl before she gave her back to the man who had just brutally raped her. Tori didn't want Terry Ann to leave and was holding onto her hand and just begging her to stay. So Terry Lynn got into the front seat and tried to hold on to Tori's hand, but she had to leave the car because she knew what was about to happen again. Mm, no words. Afterwards, Michael threw Tori to the ground. And Terry Lynn claimed Michael put the garbage bag over her head and started to kick Tori. Then Terry Lynn said Michael picked up the claw hammer and hit Tori over the head until she died. Then the couple placed her battered body into garbage bags, placed it under a tree, and covered it with some rocks. Terry Lynn said Michael used water bottles and her jacket to wash the blood off of his lower half before they got back into the car. He used Terry Lynn's jacket because he, quote, didn't want to ruin his shirt. Oh, mm mm-hmm. Terry Lynn said that they put her white jacket, Michael's shirt and pants, Tori's clothes, her brat's bag, and hammer that used to smash the little girl's head into garbage bags, which they placed into the trunk of Michael's car. Then she and Michael drove for a bit before Michael went onto a side road and told her that they needed to get rid of their shoes. After throwing the shoes out the window, Michael had two different pairs of shoes in a duffel bag in the back. He put one on, and he gave her a pair of Pumas that were too big for her. Then the couple drove to Cambridge, where Michael went to a car wash and washed the car inside and out. He even shampooed the carpets in the car. They took the trash bags with Tori's clothing, their clothing, and the claw hammer into a dumpster, and they threw some in a dumpster and some in some trash can that were near the car wash. The pair then went to a nearby store where Michael went inside to change clothes into the bathroom. There he left a gym bag with a white sweater and a pair of shorts for Terry Lynn to change into. On the way back to Woodstock, they threw the clothes that they had been wearing out the car window. Michael then brought Terry Lynn home, but instead of driving her up to the door, he dropped her off a few blocks away for her to walk home. Now, the pair didn't see each other for a few days, but they did talk about what they would do if they were ever questioned about the disappearance. Quote, we went over a scenario where if the police picked me up, what I would say, I was to say 
We were in Oakville, and we didn't have lots of money, so we only went for window shopping. When she got home, she took some Oxycontin and said she wrote it all down in her journals, quote, so I would not forget and practice what I was told to say, and that I did not mess anything up. She apparently Mm -hmm. tried to push what really happened out of her mind. Mm -hmm. Of course she did. So after Terry Lynn's confession, police go and arrest 28-year-old Michael Thomas Rafferty and charge him with kidnapping and first-degree murder, while Terry Lynn was charged with kidnapping and accessory to murder. Terry Lynn draws a sketch of where she and Michael had buried Tori, and police go out and search the area, but they couldn't find anything. So let's talk about this evil bitch Terry Lynn McClintock, shall we? Let's do. I got a few choice words. Terry Lynn was born to an exotic dancer. Her mother, biological mother, didn't want her and gave her to another exotic dancer by the name of Carol to raise. Carol already had two children, but both had been removed from her home. So, yeah, there's that. Now, Children's Aid had been warned about Carol raising a third child, but the warning seemed to fall on deaf ears. Carol was an abusive drug addict and heavy drinker, and Terry Lynn was basically left to raise herself in that environment. She left school after eighth grade, and Carol soon would get her daughter involved in her lifestyle, which isn't a great lifestyle for an adult, much less a child. According Mm -hmm. to Terry Lynn's half-sister, Carol's biological daughter, Carol and Terry Lynn would shoot up Oxycontin and Percocet, and Terry Lynn also claimed to have been raped by all the men that her mother would bring home. Terry Lynn spent most of her teen years taking cocaine and ecstasy, and before when those didn't seem to be working much, she moved on to morphine and heroin by age 17. Since she was raised in a violent home, Terry Lynn was pretty violent herself. She once hit her mother so hard that it caused her to lose most of the vision in one eye. Can you believe that? How old was she when she did that? Before 18, because she's 18 when this all happens with Tori. Wow. Now, Terry Lynn kept a journal during these times, and her journal entries detailed all of her violent fantasies and violent thoughts that she had. And, okay, little warning, a little pet violence here. In court, Terry Lynn would later admit that she once put her dog in the microwave until it screamed. No, the dog she did not. The dog later had to be put down. Yeah. Oh, my God. So Terry Lynn had a pretty hard, difficult life, a pretty shitty upbringing. Still no excuse in my book. I think it warps their mind. I was going to say, I think she's almost worse than he is. Police bring Michael Rafferty into the interrogation room, and the officer questioning him asks, quote, Am I sitting across the desk from Paul Bernardino here? Now we know Paul oh, Bernardino, yeah, right? He's like mm-hmm, infamous mm-hmm. Canadian serial killer with his little uh, girlfriend, wife, Carla Homolka. Is that how you pronounce the last name? Homolka? I, I think so. And Michael begins to hyperventilate, and he looks like he's going to vomit. And you can watch his interrogation on YouTube, too. The officer then asks, quote, do you know what a psychopath is, Mike? Mm. And Michael replies that he's never met one. And Mm. I mean, Michael can't even look him in the eye. He can't even look at the officer. He just keeps his head down the whole time. And the officer retorts, quote, well, I just met one tonight. Mm, I like that. Mm -hmm. Other points in the interview, Michael just laughs at the police contention that he killed Victoria Stafford. Like every time he's, you know, did you kill Victoria? He's, He's a piece of shit. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. trust me i hate him and terry lynn mcclinic i just mm. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i agree i mean some people are just broken and can't be fixed i truly they can't. believe that no the police go on to say you know well terry lynn just confessed to everything and he's like oh she's lying she's lying he's like oh really oh really so what do they do they bring terry lynn into the room with him and oh. she sits directly across from him she doesn't say a word He doesn't even look at her. And then he calls her a liar to his face. He does? He calls her a liar to her face? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. And then... That takes some uh, cojones. uh Uh-huh. And then the officers start to tell him about all the DNA evidence, and it doesn't lie, and 
but he never owns up to what he's done still. He doesn't. And no, of course um not. and you can also watch this. This is where I first heard about the case on TV show Signs of a Psychopath, season 1, episode 6 in case you're interested in it. At the end they kind of say that or Terry Lynn's not a psychopath, but I don't I'm not quite for sure. I mean, I don't have any background in that at all, but mm-hmm. I'm not for so sure. So sure she's not. 103 days after Tori was first reported missing, our friend, Ontario Detective Staff Sergeant Jim Smith, was out driving, and he recognized an area from Terry Lynn's sketch. He started to search the secluded field and stumbled upon a garbage bag covered by rocks. Inside mm-hmm. the bag was the tiny, broken body of Tori Stafford, wearing only a Hannah Montana t-shirt and the butterfly earrings she had borrowed from her mother. Later, a medical examiner would say that Tori had suffered four blows to the head with a claw hammer. She also had 16 broken ribs and a five-centimeter wound to her liver. Due to her injuries, he said that her death was inevitable, but it was not immediate. Poor little thing suffered. Oh, See, I, I just, I would prefer not to know that ever mm-hmm. as a parent. And I know. The ME also said that since her body was such in an advanced state of decomposition, they couldn't say if a rape had been committed or not. But they knew though, right? Because... Well, Terry said yeah. that Michael did and Michael... But Why would Michael, you say if you didn't? Well, but Michael said did, he didn't. He didn't, I mean. Right. I don't believe that. Well... They couldn't tell either way. They could, it couldn't be mm-hmm. proven. Right. Over a year and a half later, in December 2010, it was publicized that Terry Lynn McClinic had pleaded guilty to murder in April of that year and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years to be served. Now, there was a publication ban on this after concerns came up that it would jeopardize Michael Rafferty's trial and his trial was coming up. And in fact, in February of 2011, Michael was granted a change of venue from Woodstock to London, Ontario, because it was felt that he wouldn't get a very fair trial in Woodstock, which I agree with that. Michael's trial began on March 2012 of the following year. Michael, of course, pleaded not guilty to the charges of kidnapping, sexual assault, and first-degree murder. Side note, real quick, the whole... During the whole trial proceedings, Tori's family wore Tori's favorite color, purple, just to show support and to Mm -hmm. for remembrance of Tori. Mm -hmm. On one of these days, Michael had the balls to wear a shirt and tie to court the same color of purple that the family was wearing. Now, number one, did he do that on purpose? Number two, wouldn't his attorney say, I don't think so, buddy? Thank you. Thank you. If I was Tara McDonald, I would have flipped my shit on him. He has no right to wear those colors. That I color. Agree. It's a slap in the it, face. It really is. That a slap that's in the your, face. Only, your only shirt and tie. Tell somebody and they're going to go get you another one. Well, you know I, mean, I mean, the trial lasted a long time. I'm sure he wore different clothes. But like on one of the days, like, come on. Seriously. I just, I don't even know what to say. Kevin Gowdy, who was prosecutor from The Crown warned the jury that the case would be difficult to hear since Tori had such a violent death. And he also wanted them to know that it wasn't necessary for them to determine who wielded the hammer that dealt the blows that killed Tori. They just needed to decide if Michael and Terry Lynn acted together in causing Tori's death. I would say yes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same thing with the, uh, you know, a robbery. If you're the getaway driver and somebody says, hey, pull over here. I'm going to go get a Snickers because it really satisfies. And then they go in and they pull a gun and shoot the person. The driver who didn't even know that that was going to happen is still going to be held. Well, Tori took her. Scratch that. Terry Lynn took her. And if so, yeah, she's involved. Mm -hmm. She was the reason for Tori's death. Just as much, though. Yeah. Just as much, if not more. Just as much. Let's go with just as much at least. The first one of the first people to take the stand was Tori's third grade teacher, and no. she was one of the last people to see Tori alive. And she said, um, quote, it was just like a regular day for her. She was just such a lovely girl. 
And the teacher described Tori as a little girl who was, quote, bubbly, enthusiastic, very dramatic, who was obsessed with the Disney show Hannah Montana, high school musical and brats. Mm -hmm. And Tori's father would later tell the media that it was perfect how she described her, that that was Tori to a T. Just like such a little girl, you know, tiny, eight years old. My God. Many women testified at Michael's trial because he was a serial dater. He met many of these women on the Plenty of Fish website. Some of these women testified that he was obsessed with the Victoria Stanford case. He was constantly checking the news for updates. And honestly, he was even seeing one of a close friend of the family of Mm -hmm. Tara Mm McDonald's. And he even consoled her and said that he believed that Tori would be okay when he, in fact, knew that Tori was dead. Tori was oh, he, dead by the time that Linda, the grandmother, went to the police. Mm-hmm. He's getting off on it. He loved mm-hmm. that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Evidence from Michael's home was shown in court, including the jacket, like the one he had placed over Victoria. She hid in the back seat. The water bottles that the lids or the caps, the same kind of caps were found at the scene where Tori's body was found. The gym bag, of course, that was seized from his car. It mm-hmm. had DNA. It had his DNA and Tori's blood on it. And the backseat of his car was missing. Yeah, no evidence could be taken out of the car. I believe one woman said that one week she was with Michael and he had a car seat. And then a couple weeks later, or he had the seat in the back. And then a couple weeks later, the seat was gone. Wow. Something happened there. She just didn't have... Could you imagine getting into somebody's car and them not having a backseat? They took it out. Wouldn't that give well, you a red beca- flag a little bit? Well, because we do this podcast, of course. Yeah. I'd be like, and I'm out. Uh-huh. I'll catch the next ride. Thanks, yeah. though. They also found a mixture of semen and blood on the back of the front passenger seat. And he also had a just, poster in a drawer in his house. Some of people just shouldn't be. Tori, the missing person poster. Tori's missing person poster in a drawer in his house. Just, he's a monster. He's living for it. He loves mm-hmm. that stuff. Terry Lynn was called to the stand and she testified for six days. She repeated the same thing that she told Officer Jim Smith, but this time, Her ending changed. She said that she was the one that killed Tori. She kicked Tori and hit her repeatedly with a claw hammer. Terry Lynn went on to say that after she was first arrested and taken to that youth detention center in London, Michael had come to visit her, and they talked quite a bit on the phone while she was there. And it was then that she told him that she would take the fall if it came to that. And they talked about it many, many times. Quote, I said, don't worry, I'm an 18-year-old junkie anyway. I'll take the fall for everything. He had a life, a job, and things were going for him. I really had nothing. I said he had more to lose than I did. Hmm. And to that, that SOB laughed at her and said, quote, you'll do anything for a little bit of love, eh? (gasps) (sighs) I'm shocked. Now, I don't have any sympathy for her at all, but really? They seem like the perfect couple. Uh, While being cross-examined in court, she said that she didn't want to believe what she had done. So she believed at the time she was telling the truth because she had just totally put everything out of her mind. So she basically said when she told the police what happened, she blamed it on Michael, but it's because she didn't want to admit to the fact that it was her that did it. The defense tried to portray Michael as a victim of Terry Lynn's sick ploy. They alleged that she had abducted Tori uninfluenced and tried to gift Tori to Michael. Michael's defense said that he was horrified by Terry Lynn's actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So horrified he Mm -hmm. molested her. Okay. The prosecution showed graphic photos of Tori's remains to the jury and her poor broken body with only the Hannah Montana t-shirt with the words 
a girl can dream across it, were shown in the photographs. During the trial, it emerged that Terry Lynn had not changed her ultra-violent ways. While in prison for Victoria's murder, she carried out an assault on another inmate that barred horrible similarities to what had happened to Victoria. She had kicked and beat an inmate as they lay on the floor, and that was the 10th violent attack for Terry Lynn. Now, it's funny, the woman that she assaulted in this case (laughs) was an older person who was in jail for, uh, what was it, planning, getting two men to murder her ex-boyfriend. Oh, conspiracy. I'm sorry, conspiracy for murder. Yeah. Uh And they were doing a peer counseling meeting. Really? I mean, I get it, but two murderers, yeah, in a peer counseling jail thing. Doesn't seem like a good idea to me, but I guess everybody needs a friend. We all need a little therapy sometimes. (sighs) Anyway, the trial lasted for over two months, and over 150 exhibits were presented as evidence. The closing pieces for the Crown prosecution were the CCTV images allegedly showing Michael's car at areas along the route Terry Lynn said they took. The defense stated to the jury that they believed that Terry Lynn was the mastermind behind the horrific crime and Michael was just an unwilling observer. The Crown said that Terry Lynn was a, quote, violent pawn that Michael used to make this happen for himself. The jury of nine women and three men then had to decide whether or not Michael Rafferty was guilty. Although Terry Lynn took the blame for wielding the hammer that killed Victoria, she blamed Michael for years before. But once the jury believed that they acted together, it didn't matter who did what. They would both be guilty of murder. Once the jury was sent away to deliberate, media started to come out that there were a whole bunch of child sex abuse images found on Michael's computer. Mm -hmm. He had web searches with words such as underage rape and real underage rape pictures. Wow. He also had the movie Gardens of the Night, which is about a blonde eight-year-old girl that's kidnapped and sexually abused. And he had downloaded the 2006 movie Carla about Paul Bernardino Mm. and Carla Homolka a month after he and Terry Lynn murdered Tori. This information was not allowed into court as evidence because Mm -hmm. the laptop was found in Michael's car. And although the police had a warrant for the car, they didn't have a warrant to search the laptop. So that evidence was found inadmissible. Wow. I don't think Mm. it would have changed anything, though. Well, no. Well, because the jury returned a verdict of guilty on all counts. Right. And Victoria's family had to go through the ordeal of having their child missing for 103 days, then finding out she was murdered, years of waiting for justice, and having to listen to the horrifying details of a little girl's last moments. But they finally got justice for their sweet Victoria. At sentencing, Victoria's older brother, Darren, delivered a heartbreaking statement. He spoke of how his life had changed and how he'd been impacted. And he said his mother was an addict and it was really hard for her to deal with the loss. And that the father, of course, always had what happened to Victoria on his mind. And he said that he pretty much lost his identity, that he's only now known as Victoria Stafford's brother. Hmm. Michael Rafferty then delivered his own statement. And he said that he would give Victoria's mother the, quote, missing pieces of the puzzle if she wanted them. And he also once again said that he was innocent. The presiding judge, Thomas Heaney, said, Your crimes have destroyed the lives of Victoria Stafford's parents, her brother, her extended family, and her loved ones. They have terrorized an entire community who had thought its children could safely walk its streets, little knowing that people such as you lurked among them. That you were brought to justice is due entirely to the most massive and extraordinarily mobilization of police resources that this province and probably this country has ever seen. But most tragically of all, you have snuffed out the life of a beautiful, talented, vivacious little girl, a tomboy diva, 
and in the thrustful innocence of childhood. And what for? So that you could gratify your twisted and deviant desire to have sex with a child. Only a monster could commit an act as pure evil. You, sir, are a monster. It's awful. Michael attempted to appeal his conviction, but of course it was unsuccessful. And as of December of 2018, Michael Rafferty has been incarcerated at the, had been incarcerated with the La Macaza, L-A, capital M-A-C-A-Z-A, La Macaza Institution. It's a secure correctional facility that specializes in dealing with sex offenders. Terry Lynn, our buddy here, she has remained violent and unremorseful. And for some reason, she was moved to a healing lodge to serve her sentence. But people got pissed about that because a healing lodge is from, and this is from the Correctional Services of Canada website, and it's verbatim. Healing lodges are environments designed specifically for Indigenous offenders. They offer culturally appropriate services and programs to offenders in a way that incorporates Indigenous values, traditions, and beliefs. Interventions, including elder services and ceremonies, are provided to Indigenous offenders. The main goal is to address factors that led to their incarceration and prepare them for reintegration into society. Offenders must be classified as minimum security or on a case-by-case basis, medium security. People were pissed that she was in these places because obviously she's she should be in max security. I would think so. So since that public outcry, they have since moved her back to another prison. I think it's just medium security. But and last I checked, they were trying to get her into a maximum security facility. They're going to rot in prison, which I don't think I could be happier about. As they should. That is what I've got for us today. Okay, let's talk about this real quick. Like, I think, and I, it's only because I'm a mom, I guess, but I almost hold her more accountable with the little girl because the little girl trusted her. You know what I'm saying? She's young, begged she's a teenager. Her. She begged her to stand, not to let it happen again. She begged you know, her not I, to let I, her go. I think she's worse. I think she's almost a worse person than he is. She's the one that Although, kidnapped her. He wouldn't have had the balls to do it. Plus, it, it's little girls are told not to go with, what well, little kids always said, don't go with a stranger. But we all know that teenage girl is going to be a lot less scary than a guy, mm-hmm. period. You know? Well, and that signs of a psychopath, they were saying how they thought he was more of a psychopath and she wasn't. I, I'm telling you, she's manipulative and she's conniving. And I mean, maybe there's more to it. I don't have that degree, but she just seems so much worse than him. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe she's just evil on the outside and you could just see her rotting soul, whereas he's sneaky, evil. not so much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know much about that, but I just think she's evil. And even on Signs of the Psychopath, they're like, well, he talked her into it, which he might have. But from her words, it sounds like, you know, even if you, she wanted yeah, to, if you were scared, him. let's say that you were scared of him. So you're going to go along with the plan. The minute you get that little girl, the minute you hold her hand, you could fake it. You could say, you whisper to her, okay, you follow me right now. And then you would go and hand, like, there was ways that she could have saved that little girl. Right. I honestly think she did it to prove to him that she loved her and to keep him from leaving her. Yeah. I and mean, she had a shitty childhood. She a didn't lot of people have too, And that it doesn't love. make you, yeah, it doesn't make you that kind of person. But, I mean, she's violent. She's mm-hmm. beating people up. I mean, she's... <laughs> In prison, she's attacking him. She has no remorse. She's a terrible person. She's not a very good person. She's got a lot of shit to work through before she could even start being a good person. But one thing Tori Stafford's father did say is he wanted Tori's memory to live on, and he pretty much wanted her killers to go into the abyss and never hear their names again in the public. And I kind of agree with that. I mm-hmm. I do. And here we are doing a podcast. But yes, I, agree. I know. I know. But still, uh, it's speaking of the victim impact statement. Do you think that you could do that? 
I would have a difficult time, but I would try. I don't Even think though I your could voice do shakes. It. I don't think I could do it only because I would. Mm, you know me. I, 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 think I have to hear. The, I've got to talk. I've got to say my piece. But I'd be afraid that that the killer would like that. They want to see the hurt that they caused. And I just I don't know if I could be. I don't think I'd want to give them that satisfaction. And me standing up and saying what you did, you know what you did. I, I think I probably could stand up and say, I hope you rot in hell. Good luck. And maybe that. That's about it. I don't right. think I could do the long because I just think a lot of them, this is, they like that. They like the pain that they cause. They love it, you know? And then to see a parent of a child or, or a loved one stand up and like, you know, read off their one page letter of what a great person they were, you know, that a lot of those killers, they love th- that. But I think it's mostly, even though the killer, might want to hear it. I think you give those statements for the judge to because it's right before his sentencing. So you you're basically telling the mm-hmm. judge how the death of your loved one has impacted you. So it's more for the judge mm-hmm. and less for the killer. Then I would not want the killer. I would demand that he couldn't be in the courtroom or she that they could not be in the courtroom. They that's against the law because they have a right to face their accusers. Right? They do. But they <laughs> lost and they need to go away right now. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's heartbreaking. The family suffered a loss. I think Tara McDonald is now a doula. So she's helping bring babies into this world. So, yeah, I think the father still does bikeathons or something like that in Tori's name. I think she would have been 20 or 21 by now. 21. I also don't know if I could sit in a courtroom with somebody that hurt my baby. Like, I think, oof. More power I'm telling to the, you, and then show people. up in the same color that you are wearing that, to support your daughter. No, nope. uh-uh. I'd go That's for his throat. Over the edge. I would go for his throat. Horrible. Just, yeah. That was a really mm. good case, Jen. Thanks. And it's uh, pretty sad, so I don't feel like we should chit-chat a lot about mundane things like Netflix. Probably not. But yeah. I think there is, and I, how many times can I say this? I think there is no lower thing than a child killer. I mean, there's oh. just not. Hurt. I mean, and look at Terry Lynn. She had like all that. She hurt animals. She was violent. She, I don't know. I. But we know as parents that she didn't are, have a parent, though. No, but she I'm saying, really did. We know as parents there are other people that see things in the child and try to get the child help, but yet parents and guardians either refuse to see it, don't think it's a big deal, or not my child, right? You know what I'm saying here. Well, the the woman who adopted her, Carol, was mostly drunk and stoned. And, I mean, she had two other kids taken away from her before. She was abusive. You know? She was abusive. She wasn't a parent. She was just this adult that, that had a kid that lived with her. There was no parenting. She didn't care. No. And I think there's far too many adults like that out there. And then (sighs) it leaves behind a carcass of a child to go. Like they're alive, but they're not really alive. They're dead inside. You know, there's a reason that it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Guidance and all that good stuff. I mean, seriously, what kind of what kind of person could Terry Lynn have been if she would have been given a good chance of life? You know, think about would have been totally different. Mm hmm. Eileen I'm sure it would I think about her and her terrible upbringing, too, and just how much that affects a person, you know? And there are horrible. people that, that have terrible upbringings, and they, they turn out just fine. But I just think, you know, there certain people come into this world and they're strong, and certain people are not. Hug your kids. We'll get off the soapbox now. But anyway, yeah. good story, Jen. Yeah. Real quick, I just want to thank Eileen McFarlane from Crime Lab. She helped me do research on this, so... The podcast Crime Lab. So go listen to well, her podcast. Thank you, Eileen. Mm-hmm. That was she nice. Did. She helped me do research. She's a good egg. Good job. Anyway, thanks, Eileen. All right. Um. Mm-hmm. So remember, Jen, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at our true crime podcast. 
www.thecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya. I believe I remember, and I should have written this down. I should have written it. Listen to my grammar. I love I written, have, written it down. Written it down. Uh, the macar... The macar... Nope. The Macarena. Mac- Something like that. Don't.